a lecture series. My name is Patrick Barrett and I'm the Managing Director of the Center and I'll be serving as facilitator for this Zoom event. Before we get started, however, I'd like to just offer a, a quick word about the Havens Wright Center for Social Justice, um, for those of you who may not be familiar with it. Based at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, the mission of the center is to pr promote critical intellectual reflection and exchange both within the academy as well as between it and the broader society. The center is named in honor of the late professors of rural sociology and sociology, A. Eugene Havens and Eric Olin Wright, whose life and work embodied the combination of scholarly rigor, progressive social and political commitment that the center seeks to encourage. One of our main activities is our visiting scholars program, which during normal times brings distinguished scholars, public intellectuals and activists to Madison to lecture on their work. However, because we are not living in normal times, we've taken our lectures online. This has its obvious disadvantages, most importantly that we aren't able to meet with the speakers in person. But the silver lining to this COVID cloud is that we are able to reach a much larger audience, as evidenced by the tremendous number of people who have reg registered for today's talk by Arun Kundanani. The turnout also reflects the relevance of the topic of his talk, what is racial capitalism? This is the second speaker in our fall series, uh, the complete lineup for which you can find on our website, which was posted on a slide when you first entered the room. Uh, I'll repeat it here, Havens Wright Center, all one word, dot wisc dot edu. A quick plug for the next couple of weeks. Uh, we have coming up next week, Irma Velasquez Nimatuj, a Maya Kiche social anthropologist, journalist, and activist who'll be talking about the resistances and challenges of the contemporary Maya. And then the following week, we have two speakers, Stephanie Luce from the Cooney School of Labor and Urban Studies, who'll be talking about the possibilities and limitations of worker organizing in anti-capitalist movements. And then also Helen Scott, professor of English at the University of Vermont, who will be talking about Rosa Luxemburg and literature. Again, you can find information about those and the rest of our speakers on our website. So before turning it over to the person who will be introducing Arun, a couple of housekeeping notes. First of all, what I'd like to ask you to do is to keep your cameras off. Uh, this is so that if we have any problems with bandwidth or the like, we, it, it will limit those um, risks. Um, I also wanna mention that Arun will be speaking for about 45 minutes after which he'll field questions from the audience. And I'll explain the format for doing that once we reach that point. And we're gonna try to conclude by 5.30 p.m. Central Time. Finally, I wanna mention that this session is being recorded and will be for, before too long be posted to our website and therefore available to all of those of you who have friends, uh, curious, intellectually curious and politically engaged friends, colleagues, workmates who weren't able to join us today. And to clarify, only those who speak will be recorded, namely Arun, um, along with those who are asking questions, uh, whose voices will be unmuted for that purpose, along with those of us moderating the call. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to the person who will be introducing Arun, someone who knows his work very well, namely Deepa Kumar, Professor of Media Studies at Rutgers University. Thank you, Patrick. It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Arun Kundanani. Arun is my colleague, my co-author on several pieces, my comrade and friend. Arun is an award-winning scholar, researcher, public intellectual, and activist. He's the author of two path-breaking books, The End of Tolerance, Racism in, the, in 21st Century Britain, and more recently, The Muslims Are Coming, Islamophobia, Extremism, and the Domestic War on Terror. The Muslims Are Coming was one of the first and most comprehensive accounts of counterterrorism policy in the US and UK, and its devastating impact on Muslims, Arabs, South Asians, and also African-American Muslims. He moved to the US in 2010 from the UK after receiving the prestigious Open Society Fellowship which is designed to support individuals pursuing innovative and unconventional approaches 
to fundamentally open society challenges. So he moved from the belly of the old empire into the new empire and we welcome him with open arms. Um, he was also awarded the Scholar in Residence Fellowship by the Schoenberg Center for Research in Black Culture. This is for a book he's working on on H. Rap Brown. Arun has authored dozens of peer-reviewed journal articles, book chapters, and written scores of articles that have appeared in mainstream and independent media. He's given interviews for numerous media outlets like the BBC, NPR, CNN, and Democracy Now. His writing has made an impact on policy debates as well as among activists fighting against racism. And his work has been translated into several languages and is read around the world. He has also given guest lectures and keynote lectures in both the US and in sub several countries in Europe. In fact, Arun is one of the leading scholars of Islamophobia in the world. Finally, Arun has served as editor of the important journal Race and Class that has produced numerous cutting edge articles on the issue of race, racism, capitalism, and class. Um, in fact, it is the third most cited journal on the topic of race and ethnicity of all journals um, on this topic. I could say more, but I will stop here because we are all eager to hear from Arun about what racial capitalism is. And certainly in light of the recent protests after the execution of George Floyd, there's been an increased interest in trying to grapple with the question of the relationship between racism and capitalism. And Arun is one of the sharpest minds on questions of race and class will, I'm sure, have some really illuminating things to say on this very important question. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Dr. Arun Pundanani. Uh, thank you very much. Um, after, after all that introduction, um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's weird that I don't actually have a job, right? <laughs> it's like, I'm still unemployed in spite of all that. Um, but there you go. Um, that's why in the in the blurb for the event it says Arun Kandanani author <laughs> rather than New York University or somewhere like that. Or, author is a euphemism for unemployed. So <laughs> there you go. Um, but thank you very much. And um, it's it's you know I really appreciate being given this um, platform by um, the Havens Wright Center to talk about racial capitalism. Um, so let's get straight into it. Um, so in re you know in recent years this term racial capitalism has proliferated amongst um, scholars and activists. I've um, seen articles in, in um, places like the New Yorker, um, Vox, um, introducing the term to a wide readership. Um, it's beginning to be one of those terms that has you know, institutional weight in the academy um, with a plethora of, of research initiatives emerging in recent years, um, funding from the Mellon Foundation, um, but we're still in the process of, of clarifying what we mean by this term racial capitalism, right? So for example, if you go to the website of the um, research initiative on racial capitalism at UC Davis, um, click on the link that says, what is racial capitalism? Um, you get a blank page, which, which kind of um, is, is uh, indicative, it seems to me, perhaps accidentally. Um, so, so the scholars who use the term um, agree, at least, that it refers to the mutual dependence of capitalism and racism. Um, Walter Johnson writes that racial capitalism is a sort of capitalism that relies upon the elaboration, reproduction, and exploitation of notions of racial difference. Uh, for Peter Hudson, um, racial capitalism suggests both the simultaneous historical emergence of racism and capitalism in the modern world and their mutual dependence. Um, everyone agrees that the framework of racial capitalism is a challenge to the narrative that capitalism matured out of the racism and violent coercion of the slave plantations to a system based upon labor that is free, waged, and homogenous. So as uh, Robin Kelly has written, capitalism was not the great modernizer giving birth to the European proletariat as a universal subject. Okay, so the promise of the term um, lies in its, in its apparent bridging of the economic and the cultural, um, of the class struggle and the struggle against white supremacy, uh, seeming to allow us maybe to understand police and plantation violence as linked to capital accumulation. Um, it promises a way to close the race class gap on the left that um, 
Trump and Brexit marched through um, with their nationalist constructions of a white working class. The term racial capitalism seems to offer a way to a way through the debate about so-called identity politics that has marked the uh, Euro-American left since the 70s. So we're going to return to this um, very old question of race and class and try to clarify what the term racial capitalism might mean. Uh, now I'm going to suggest that um, we reconstruct the term's meaning from the work of scholars who were based in the UK in the late 1970s and early 80s. First, uh, from exiles from the movement against South African apartheid, um, who were the first to use the term racial capitalism. Second, uh, Cedric Robinson, um, who, who at that time was based in the UK, working on his influential book, Black Marxism. And thirdly, uh, Stuart Hall, um, who in his work during this period offered I think the, the most effective account of um, racial capitalism. Um, now in the UK of the late 1970s and early 80s, the contours of what we would now call neoliberalism were first becoming visible. But at the same time, you had older traditions of black anti-colonial and working class struggles in Britain, uh, in the third world and in the United States that still had enough um, life in them to provide the seeds of analysis of this newly emerging political terrain that we now continue to live with. So all these struggles converged in Britain at the time to produce what I think was a space of political and theoretical creativity. Uh, two quick clarifications before I get into the core of my presentation. So first, um, my way of reconstructing these discussions is, of course, one amongst uh, multiple possible readings. Uh, second, the scholars I'm considering largely did not directly engage with each other. So my placing them together is, is somewhat of an act of constructive interpretation. Uh, Stuart Hall himself didn't even use the term racial capitalism, so to present him as offering a way of theorizing it is, is to stretch his work at least beyond his own terminology. Okay, so um, in 1976, the anti-apartheid movement in London published a pamphlet entitled Foreign Investment and the Reproduction of Racial Capitalism in South Africa. It was, I think, um, as far as I can tell, the first time that this term racial capitalism was used. And at this time, the anti-apartheid movement was calling for an international boycott of South African exports. In response, opponents of the boycott um, argued that economic growth and continued industrialization in South Africa would in fact weaken the influence of racism in South Africa. Um, and this pamphlet um, set out to show on the contrary that South African racism was strengthened, not weakened by uh, capitalist growth. Capitalism was not the solution to racism, but the soil upon which it grew. The pamphlet's authors, uh, Martin Legasic and David Hempson, were part of a group of South African Marxists working in the 1970s that included Harold Wolpe and Neville Alexander, who started using the term racial capitalism to analyze the political economy of apartheid South Africa. Now, I'm not gonna go into the detail of the variations in the evolution of um, the different analyses that these scholars produced, um, uh, and nor am I gonna go into detail about how they built on thinking along similar lines um, from people like sociologist John Rex or uh, Giovanni Origi's work on Rhodesia. I'm just going to trace a, a kind of rough line of thinking that was later picked up by uh, Stuart Hall and Cedric Robinson. So um, South Africa made apartheid its official policy in 1948, while the rest of the world was claiming to, um, at least claiming to eradicate racism after the defeat of Nazism in 1945. Um, by the 1970s, the apartheid regime seemed impregnable. The Sharpeville massacre in 1960 put an end to mass protests. And then over the next decade, um, the regime imprisoned or exiled leaders of the uh, underground liberation movement. And there was rapid industrial growth um, at levels that resembled Europe or the United States. So how could such a society be made sense of in Marxist terms? In the Communist Manifesto, Marx and Engels, wrote that capitalism would tend to sweep away uh, what they call ancient and venerable prejudices. Capitalist development was, it was assumed, rational in the sense that it organized itself according to abstract rules that were in principle generally applicable, not based on irrational and arbitrary differentiations such as race. But in South Africa, uh, the force of racism seemed to increase the more advanced its capitalist economy became. The apartheid system was not a legacy from the 19th century that had survived into the 1970s, it was the creation of a modern capitalist state in the 1940s. In apartheid South Africa, the prevailing social antagonism did not appear to be owners of industrial capital arrayed against an industrial waged workforce, but a, a white minority ruling over a black majority, 
nor could one plausibly claim that racism served as an ideological means to divide the working class and mask its true interests. Apartheid was obviously more than a propaganda campaign to manipulate white workers. Moreover, apartheid could not be explained as simply the expression of trans historical prejudices or hatreds. In very specific ways, it was a formation of the 20th century. Now, one possible interpretation within the Marxist tradition then was uh, the theory of national oppression, drawing on uh, Lenin's analysis of imperialism. So in South Africa, this would be framed as a kind of internal colonialism. Um, but on this view, imperialism was supposed to freeze capitalist development, um, which would imply a, the need for a nationalist anti-colonial struggle that had to be waged first before an anti-capitalist class struggle could take place to create a socialist society. And in fact, that was the uh, so-called two-stage program that the South African Communist Party um, in fact adopted in, in 1962. But the problem is that in South Africa, capitalism was not being frozen in that kind of way that European colonialism normally did. Um, South Africa's apparent refusal then to fit traditional Marxist categories and the fact of an African revolutionary struggle against apartheid um, forced a, a productive creativity in Marxist theory. So Martin Legasic, Harold Wolpe, and Neville Alexander began precisely with what seemed uh, distinctive about South Africa, the seeming coexistence of an urban industrial capitalist economy centered upon white society and a black centered rural non-capitalist economy. They noted that in the areas of African concentration, land was held communally and worked by social units based on extended family networks. What was produced was distributed not by market exchange, by di but directly according to kinship rules. Much of this non-capitalist subsistence economy existed in the so-called reserves, areas that had successfully resisted European conquest until the late 19th century. But rather than see this subsistence economy as outside of capitalism and destined to be dissolved by it in a process of disposition and uh, expulsion, in other words, primitive accumulation, uh, instead, uh, the two, the, these two economic systems were combined together in a single structure. Okay, so in, um, in Europe, uh, you know, standard idea would be that a necessary condition for the establishment and reproduction of capitalism was the violent wave of enclosures of common land that inaugurated the modern regime of private property and produced a population removed from direct um, subsistence and therefore forced into waged work. But in South Africa, uh, they argued, a precondition of capitalism was the preservation of non-capitalist economies, not their destruction. By employing temporary migrant workers from the reserves, capital was able to pay for labor power far below its cost of reproduction because it did not have to cover the full cost of subsistence, housing, care of the young, the old, the sick, and so on. Uh, so the African non-capitalist economy could meet these needs, enabling capitalists to profit from an exceptionally high rate of exploitation. What emerged then was a differentiated economy. On the one hand, white workers were fully proletarianized and able to claim individual and social wages sufficient to meet their needs of subsistence. On the other hand, black workers were semi-proletarianized, temporarily migrating from the reserves for waged work in the industrial sector as needed, but whose subsistence was met largely by a non-capitalist economy. Now for this arrangement to be sustainable, the non-capitalist economy needed to be productive enough to enable the reproduction of a labor force for capital. Otherwise, there would be permanent African migration to the urban areas and then demands for the same subsistent wages as whites. But at the same time, it could not be so productive that Africans became self-sufficient and escaped the orbit of capitalism altogether. Now, apartheid uh, was a political means to maintain this divided but combined social formation. The movement of labor was controlled through apartheid past laws to ensure the racial division of labor was upheld, while the reserves were granted uh, a kind of quasi autonomy with so called tribal chiefs constituting a comprador class to manage and sustain the non capitalist sector on the terms set by racial capitalists. Now, this argument has a number of important consequences. It implies that our picture of capitalism has to be altered. Once we accept that capitalism can stably coexist with other modes of production in a complex structure within a single social formation, then any teleological or evolutionary assumptions have to be thrown out. We can no longer hold that capitalism of necessity seeks the abolition of pre-existing modes of production. 
our picture is now of a capitalism that is conjoined with non-capitalisms, a capitalism that fails to universalize itself. Primitive accumulation begins to appear then not as a transitional phase at the birth of capitalism, but a permanent aspect of it. And this is a good place uh, to acknowledge that I live on land that was stolen from the Cayuga Nation as part of one such process of primitive accumulation. Now, this new picture of capitalism also gives us an account of the structural reasons why capitalist development was imbricated with racism. Differentiation of the workforce as much as homogenization can be derived from capitalism's core dynamics. Racism is the means by which this differentiation is coded and managed, the terms upon which capitalism narrates its own failure to universalize. And because waged labor is not universalized, nor are the political structures of liberal democracy that in Western Europe at least, were forged in the conflicts between waged labor and capital. State racism, violence, mass coercion of subordinate workers then are the correlates of this failure to universalize waged labor. Whatever the long histories of racial prejudice, uh, on this view, racism under capitalism is not conceived as a kind of archaism or a legacy that somehow anachronistically survives from the past into the capitalist present. Rather, we can now explain racism as a material force within the development of these particular social formations, and we can do so without creating the problem of dual or triple structures of power, you know, race, class, gender, and thinking of those as separate, um, separable, uh, autonomous, and then struggling to work out how they fit together. Um, so this is quite a different argument from the common Marxist claim that, you know, that you'd see in the work of someone like, say, David Harvey or Amy Skin Woods, um, that racism is primarily an ideological division among waged workers. Instead here, black and white labor are divided materially as well as ideologically. Their respective relations to the means of production are of a quite different character. Uh, there is therefore no prospect that black and white might become conscious of their true shared interests and as in the old slogan, unite and fight. Rather, there would have to be an autonomous black struggle against racial capitalism. And that should tell you how far we've come from uh, Marxist orthodoxy. Okay, so South Africa. Um, so the current prevalence of the term racial capitalism originates from recent interest in, in Cedric Robinson's uh, black Marxism with its immense reach and powerful challenge uh, to a lot of conventional ways of thinking. So uh, Robinson researched the book while he was in Cambridge, England in the late 1970s. Um, while there, he, he found a home with the journal Race and Class, published by the Institute of Race Relations in London. Um, his first article in that journal uh, on uh, Richard Wright appeared in 1978. In 1980, he joined the journal's editorial working group. And um, over the coming decades, Race and Class published a good deal of his work. Um, in the 1970s, the journal Race and Class was one of the main scholarly outlets for the analysis of the struggle in southern Africa, uh, the black struggles in Britain, anti-imperialist politics in general. Um, the, you know, the work of Neville Alexander, uh, who I mentioned earlier, for example, was discussed in the journal. Now, the argument of Robinson's black Marxism can be read as building on the currents he was encountering in England and connecting them to the black radical tradition in the United States. Uh, people like W.B. Du Bois, Oliver Cromwell Cox, C.L.R. James, Claudia Jones, James Boggs, who've you know, all, through this, uh, all through the 20th century been thinking of how racism and capitalism are mutually imbricated. Um, so while the South African Marxists were working on the basis that South Africa presented an exception to the general traditional Marxist assumptions, Robinson turns the argument on its head. He says the exception was in fact the rule. What the South Africans had um, called racial capitalism was not only to be found in South Africa, but wherever capitalism prevailed. All capitalisms um, are racial capitalism. Um, and the orthodox Marxist account of capitalism therefore has to be rethought, not just in, in colonized settings, but even in Western Europe, where uh, for Robinson, racial divisions of labor existed throughout the history of capitalism. Okay. Um, so for him, racial capitalism is first a question of labor. The exploitation of wage labor that Marx analyzes um, in volume one of Capital is, uh, he says, an incomplete account of capitalist societies. Um, his claim is that capitalism has never been able to universalize the relationship between capital and waged labor. At no point in the history of capitalism has most of the work done been organized through the kind of exploitation described in, in Capital, uh, volume one. As he writes, um, certainly slave labor was one of the bases 
for what Marx termed primitive accumulation. But it could be an error, it would be an error to arrest the relationship there, assigning slave labor to some pre-capitalist stage of history. For more than 300 years, slave labor persisted beyond the beginnings of modern capitalism, complementing wage labor, peonage, serfdom, and other modes of, la uh, of labor coercion. From its very foundations, capitalism had never been, any more than Europe, a closed system, end quote. So you have to think of um, multiple differentiations of forms of labor involving varying degrees of non-economic coercion. Um, and moreover, that differentiation um, is organized through race. So he says the tendency of European civilization through capitalism was thus not to homogenize, but to differentiate, to exaggerate regional subcultural and dialectical differences into racial ones. And all of this is what he means by the, uh, what he calls the non-objective character of capitalist development or racial capital. So like the South African Marxists, um, Robinson introduces the idea of the coexistence of modes of production within, within a single uh, social formation. Like them, he sees capitalism not as a universal modern, modernizing force, but instead as preserving aspects of pre-capitalist society. And he shares with them the idea that racism is a means by which the relationship between these modes of production and the associated differentiated forms of labor are coded, managed, legitimated. So capitalism on this view constantly recreates itself through differentiations of wage, non-wage or surplus labor, which in turn are associated with racial and colonial divisions between possessors and dispossessed, between citizens endowed with liberal rights and those who, um, who are unfree, between productive humanity and disposable humanity. Okay. Uh, Nicholas Singh's book, um, Race and America's Long War, uh, powerfully develops this argument. And you can see this argument, you know, you can see how it could be supplemented and coordinated with the emphasis that um, socialist feminists such as Selma James and Sylvia Federici and uh, Maria Mies have placed upon domestic labor as another hidden dimension of unwaged labor under capitalism. Um, but now in drawing out the significance of this argument in Robinson's work, we get, I think, two different registers of how he understands this. So um, we have what I would call the problem of origins and the problem of reproduction. So with the problem of origins, um, Robinson is concerned to identify racism's founding moment, its initial constitution. Okay. So with the problem of reproduction, on the other hand, Robinson is concerned with how racism constantly rework, reworks itself in new circumstances, how it overcomes the inevitability of resistance, how it stays the same while changing. Okay. So two different um, kind of registers in which to think about um, the history of racism. Um, so, on the problem of origins, Robinson argues that European racism, or he uses the term um, racialism or racial sensibilities, uh, racism precedes capitalism, it precedes colonialism, it precedes the transatlantic slave trade, um, historically and in a certain sense ontologically as well. Uh, a racial calculus, he says, was, quote, reiterated and embellished by one European ruling order after another one cohort of clerical or secular propagandists following another from at least the 12th century. Um, uh, once the slave, the transatlantic slave trade starts, um, he says the Negro, uh, in inverted commas, is invented as a legitimating figure, but it's built on pre-existing racial forms within Europe, uh, such as images of Slavs, of Irish, of Jews, of Muslims, and so on. Uh, racism, uh, Robinson says, runs deep in the bowels of Western culture, right? What a, what a terrific metaphor. Um, and, and inevitably it reverberated through the relations of production um, and forms of consciousness, consciousness that have emerged from that culture. So his suggestion is that capitalism expresses economically the racism that inheres in European culture. Okay? Capitalism did not, um, as, as the, the Communist Manifesto suggests, melt away um, those pre-existing structures of racism, but instead mediated them. In this register, uh, racism is understood um, at the most fundamental level in terms of this kind of idea of transmission of Western cultural norms, right? And it's this part of Robinson's work that can support the idea of race as this kind of trans-historical substrate inhering in Western culture from its birth. Okay. Now, the other register in Robinson's work is the problem of reproduction. And here the focus is upon the constant work of reconfiguring race in new contexts. In this register, racism cannot be explained as a kind of fixed category passed down from a founding moment that hardwired the affordances of Western culture. 
Um, Robinson introduces the term racial regimes to address this problem of reproduction. So in the introduction to his book, Forgeries of Memory and Meaning, he writes that racial regimes are constructed social systems in which race is proposed as a justification for the relations of power, while necessarily articulated with accruals of power, the covering conceit of a racial regime is a makeshift patchwork masquerading as memory and the immutable. Nevertheless, racial regimes do possess history, that is, discernible origins and mechanisms of assembly. Uh, he goes on, they sometimes collapse under the weight of their own artifices, practices and apparatuses. They may fragment, desiccated by new realities. Moreover, um, for Robinson, racial re regimes can, um, he can see them quite straightforwardly as grounded in re relations of production. So he says, um, the needs of finance capital in the late 19th and early 20th century uh, determined the construction of successive racial regimes. Or he says, the creation of the Negro was obviously at the cost of immense expenditures of psychic and intellectual energies in the West. The exercise was obligatory. It was an effort commensurate with the importance black labor power possessed for the world economy, sculpted and dominated by the ruling and mercantile classes of Western Europe. Okay. Um, but elsewhere, Robinson is averse to allow property relations, uh, relations of production, to be sufficient explanation for racism. Um, what he calls the nastiness of racial capitalism, its violence, its terror, must involve, he thinks, more than modes of production. Um, so he says it can, uh, and what he's basically saying is it can only fully be explained by that, that shittiness in the bowels of Western culture, right? Um, it, so it seems to me that there's a tension here between the picture of racism as constantly regenerated through changing relations of production and the picture of racism as exceeding its imbrication with relations of production and ultimately re, uh, residing in a separate history understood as the transmission of cultural norms, okay? um, kind of autonomously. So however we resolve this tension, um, the implication for movements are pretty clear. Radical opposition to capitalism is not for Robinson generated only from within the dialectic of capital and waged labor, but also from the antagonism between capital and the various other categories of non-waged, coerced and surplus labor within racial capitalism, from the enslaved to the lumpen proletariat, the racialized lump, lumpen proletariat that the uh, Black Panther Party saw as the vanguard of the revolution in the United States. Moreover, Robinson argues, and this is a logical consequence from his uh, position, um, the cultural resources upon which those struggles are going to be waged will not be generated only from when, when um, capitalist modernity itself, but also from cultural repertoires that predate capitalism. Um, and this is where Robinson's attention to the black radical tradition comes in as a, uh, what he calls an evolving resistant of, resistance of African peoples to oppression that has a specifically African character and whose meanings are distinct from the foundations of Western ideas and are rooted in what he calls the raw material of reconstituted African values, ideas, conceptions and constructions of reality. Okay, okay. let's turn to uh, Stuart Hall um, uh, and his work in the 1970s and early 1980s on these same questions. Now, Hall uh, directly engaged with the South African Marxist debate in his essay, uh, Race, Articulation, Society, Structured in Dominance, published in 1980. And in um, the final chapter of the classic co-authored volume, Policing the Crisis, Mugging the State and Law and Order, published in 1978, um, Hall's argument is also shaped by his engagement with these debates, um, with US discussions of agency in the aftermath of the Black Power Movement and the work within the UK Black Movement on the relationship of racism to capitalism. Now, after 1980 or so, Stuart Hall um, moves away from this mode of analysis um, and, and turns to a kind of focus upon identity that's, that's much more detached from questions of political economy and state power. I think um, providing some of the intellectual groundwork for the, uh, the, the abandoning of socialism by the Labour Party under Tony Blair, which and it's an error that um, he seems to acknowledge towards the end of his life. But I think these two earlier texts um, remain crucial references for us in understanding racial capitalism, even though he doesn't use the term. Um, so like Robinson, Hall generalizes from the South African argument. He suggests that in colonial context, there's no inevitable tendency for waged labor to be universalized, even in the long run. Colonial capitalism is marked by a proliferation of different forms of labor and associated ascriptive statuses. And where capitalism develops in this way, 
racist political discourse serves to resolve the resulting tension between a kind of vaunted universalism and the particularism of forms of labor. So race provides the means to naturalize and dehistoricize the boundaries between these different categories of labor that are accorded different rights and privileges. Paul does not want to be too determinist about this relationship between relations of production and race. Um, he, thinks it's, uh, he thinks of it in terms of what he calls tendential combinations rather than mechanical causation. He does not think one can build from this relationship a general theory of racism. But he says this kind of explanation of the emergence and operation of racism, he says, provides a better, sounder point of departure from those approaches which are ob obliged to desert the economic level in order to produce additional factors which explain the origin and appearance of racial structuralism, structuring at other levels of the social formation. Okay, so it follows in, um, in Hall's account that racism is not the trans-historical cultural force, but it sometimes appears to be in Robinson's work. Um, for Hall, it's a mistake to think that there is some underlying structure of racism in Western culture or in capitalism or in the United States that lays down uh, an originating moment and then uh, acts uniformly and mechanically thereafter. He writes, unless one attributes to race a single unitary trans-historical character, such that wherever and whenever it appears, it always assumes the same autonomous features, then one, one must deal with the historical specificity of race in the modern world. Here, one is then obliged to agree that race relations are directly linked with economic processes. Um, historically, the problem here is not whether economic structures are relevant to racial divisions, but how the two are theoretically connected. And this is Hall's commitment to a Gramscian conjunctural materialist approach. It's a difficult commitment to maintain because white supremacy appears to be a constant feature of modernity, right? But Hall says that ignores resistance. Racism has to adapt to overcome that resistance. It therefore always registers the traces of that resistance in its structures. So for Hall, um, whatever conclusion we reach about the origins of racism, whether we think of it as Bacon's Rebellion in 17th century Virginia, whether we think of it as 1492 or the Crusades or the Battle of Tours in 732 or Aristotle, I mean, take your pick of what origin story you like, whatever conclusion we come to on that, um, it does not settle the question of how and why racism reproduces itself today. We can't understand, say, mass incarceration in the United States as the expression of an anti-blackness that was enshrined at the birth of modernity and since then has acted as a kind of trans-historical force um, as if its reproduction from one conjunction to the next can be assumed a priori, right? The past cannot serve as an alibi for the present. And without an explanation of racial capitalism's reproduction today, our political strategies to abolish it will be ineffective, okay? So how might we briefly apply the kind of analysis I've been developing to today's context? Um, let's start with what Hall would call the conjuncture and its relations of production. First, from the 1970s, um, there's been a new global regime of capital accumulation that we can call neoliberalism. Uh, through privatization, commodification, and financialization, uh, this has involved what uh, Susan Ferguson and David McNally called the most accelerated and extensive processes of primitive accumulation in world history. Okay. This has produced a mass rendering of surplus populations across the global south and in the north. Okay. Neoliberalism surplus po populations are generally not engaged as wage labor by capital, even for short periods. They are, as Achille Mbembe has written, unable to be exploited at all. They are abandoned subjects, relegated to the role of a superfluous humanity. Capital hardly needs them anymore to function. Um, Kalyan Sanyol calls them the wasteland populations, defined by their being fully excluded from capitalist exploitation, not even able to serve as a, um, as a reserve army of occasional labor, right? Uh, Gargi Bhattacharya develops this argument in her excellent recent book on racial capitalism. Now, race um, serves as the means by which neoliberalism organized and codes the complex dispersed boundaries between these surplus populations and others. Um, between the exploitable and the unexploitable, between the free and the unfree, the deserving and the undeserving. Uh, race is a material feature of the global division of labor that neoliberalism generates. Ideologically, neoliberalism is haunted by the existence of these surplus populations. They signify a limit to its reach, a failure to universalize, a space, a space from within which resistance is generated. The tension between the desire for a universal market order and the anxiety that there are limits to market rule, 
is, reserve, is resolved through race, which enables neoliberalism's limits to be naturalized and dehistoricized. Political opposition to market systems mounted by movements of the global south or racialized populations in the north is then read by neoliberal ideology as no more than the acting out of cultures inherently lacking in the appropriate traits of individualism and entrepreneurial spirit. So this displaces the political conflicts generated by neoliberalism onto the more comfortable terrain of clashes of culture. Okay. So in particular, racisms of the border, of law and order, and of counterterrorism are the arenas within which the complex fears, tensions, and anxieties generated by neoliberalism and its discontents are projected and worked through. The surplus dispossessed come to be represented through a series of racist figures, welfare queens, Muslim extremists, illegals, narcos, super predators, and so on, as part of the process of securing neoliberalism in the, in the realm of ideology. These figures of economic dependency, violations of property, and threats to Western culture rework older forms of racism to produce images that are distinctive to the neoliberal era. What these figures have in common is they're representing limits to market logic. They serve as displaced signifiers of neoliberalism's failure to universalize its legitimacy. They are analogs of the black mugger whom Stuart Hall described in the 1970s as a signifier of the crisis in the urban colonies. What he meant was that Racist figures are not conjured out of nothing in the corridors of power, um, but involve displacement along a signifying chain from actual political insurgencies or social antagonisms to the racist fantasies that fail to represent them. Okay? So behind the fantasy of the welfare queen or the Muslim extremist or the illegal immigrant lies the fears of actual black radicalism, of the actual Palestinian national movement, of the actual uh, politicization of the working class induced by migrant workers. By associating poverty, deviancy, radicalism with blackness, for example, the poverty, deviancy, and radicalism of all surplus populations, including some whites, is more easily managed, managed ideologically. Racism enables state violence in general. Okay? So politically, race offers the neoliberal state organizing terms for embedding markets in systems of spatial order and for policing surplus populations. In the state's practices of, of so-called law and order, of securing borders, of national security, race is both concealed and constitutive. The dramatic increase under neoliberalism in the capacity of states to carry out policing, carceral border, and military violence domestically and globally is linked to the need to manage surplus populations, and it's racially coded. Uh, a transnational security infrastructure led by the United States but dispersed globally through the nation state system, spatially organizes the neoliberal order through race. Racist bordering regimes with their huge death tolls in the seas and deserts to the south of Europe and the United States, um, and their warehousing of millions of people in camps conveniently far from the West. Um, think of racist projects of broken windows policing and mass incarceration, which as Ruth Wilson Gilmore has shown is, is another form of warehousing of surplus populations. Um, think of global infrastructures of counterinsurgency, such as the racist wars on terror, war on drugs, causing the deaths of hundreds of thousands. Um, all this is inextricable from neoliberalism's market order. The global policing of blacks, of migrants, of Muslims, therefore meshes with and comes to stand in ideologically for the broader problem of policing neoliberalism's surplus populations within and without the West. And it's not Coincidental that the think tank networks involved in promoting neoliberal political economies have typically also been the key mobilizers of projects of racist policing, incarceration, counterterrorism, and so on. In particular, the neoliberal border produces racially, racial segregation as absolutely and violently as the Jim Crow laws of the US South or South African apartheid. The border becomes the key tool for producing spatial boundaries between different kinds of laboring populations, and it's a material aspect of the racist global division of labor under neoliberalism. In this way, to draw on Stuart Hall, race is the modality in which the global structure of class relations is lived, the medium through which they are experienced, the form in which they are appropriated and fought through, not only a, a kind of ideological trick, but the material and social base on which racism as an ideology flourishes. It follows that the kind of racist politics that have surged in recent years cannot be analyzed 
um, as masks with which to conceal a supposed non-racial economic court in neoliberalism. Rather, they can only be made sense of by understanding that material and social base of actual racial divisions of labor and the racist practices of neoliberal states, which provide a legitimacy and a kind of spontaneous folk legitimacy and plausibility um, to right-wing racist political rhetoric. So Trump has thrived because his rhetoric resonates with decades of neoliberal bipartisan state practice in the name of securing the United States from illegal drugs, from uh, immigration, from terrorism and so on. The recent electoral successes of racist politicians and parties are not an indirect consequence of the devastation that neoliberalism wreaks, as scholars such as Wendy Brown have argued, Rather, they are the making explicit of a racial ordering that neoliberalism has always worked for. Now, it follows from this uh, analysis that our movements against neoliberalism um, will of necessity be rooted in the specific cultural and political histories of laboring and surplus populations constituted in racial differentiation. I don't have time to paint a picture of what those movements might look like and the kinds of questions of strategy and coordination they throw up, but I want to leave you with um, an image from A. Sivanandan, another key thinker of racial capitalism in Britain in this same period and the founding editor of the journal Race and Class. He narrates the so-called Pentonville Five case of 1972 in which five white workers were arrested and imprisoned for organizing unofficial picketing uh, in support of a strike by dockers. Now the trade unions, um, uh, at this time invited black organizations to join a march to Pentonville prison in London where the men were being held. The dilemma for black organizations was that, um, well, they recognized that that struggle, the trade union struggle was also their struggle, they were workers too. But on the other hand, um, the entrenched racism of the trade unions meant they would not join the official march. Moreover, um, you know, a few years ago, those same trade unions had been marching in support of the racist politician Enoch Powell, and to those black organizations, imprisonment was an aspect of state racism that impinged on their communities in a distinct way. So instead, black organizations led a different march down a different road to the same spot on behalf of the Pentonville Five. Same destination, different journey. Not the intersection of identities or oppressions, but the intersection of movements. Not a hierarchy of oppression, but an opening out to other struggles while maintaining the specificity of one's own understood in this way, what some people still insist on calling identity politics does not fragment class struggle, but radicalizes it. Thank you. All right, well, thank you very much. That was really fabulous and super interesting. And I'm sure the source of lots of questions. Um, so let me explain to everybody uh, the format that we're gonna proceed with. We have approximately, because we wanna end by 5.30 PM Central Time, uh, 37 minutes to be precise. And so what we're going to do is we're going to ask um, people to raise their hand. And the way you do that is if, if you go to the participants um, part of the menu at the bottom of your screen, you can raise your hand. That will alert me that you wanna ask a question. What we're going to do is we're gonna field three questions at a time. Uh, and each of you will get an opportunity of, among those three to raise the question to Arun, and then he will respond to the sum total of those three questions. Um, I'm gonna ask you to uh, be brief if you can, because if we have a large number of questions, we wanna be able to um, field as many of those as possible. So go ahead and do that now if you do have a question for Arun. Don't be shy. Um, let's see, somebody's. All right, I have Eve. Eve, why don't you go ahead? Um, hi, thank you for a great talk. And um, I just wondered if you could talk more about the role of war. Uh, be, I understand the you know, war on terror and so on is about demarcating the limits of these surplus populations, but War is still also going on in terms of, you know, the devastation of other regions of the world through arms and things like that. So how, how does war fit into this um, model that you are uh, 
elucidating for us. Thank you. Thanks, Eve. I also have a question that was submitted to me via chat. And if you have the same problem that Colleen S. has, where she doesn't have the ability to use your microphone or her microphone, uh, you can submit a question that way. But she was hoping, she says, to ask how indigenous worldviews that are much more holistic and rooted in nature factor into Arun's theories. Anybody else with a question for Arun? We have room for one more in this cluster of questions. Conrad. Uh, hi, Arun. Um, I just wanted to ask if you could sort of in, in line with the, the, the Eve's question about surplus populations, if you might talk a little bit well, maybe just give a couple more concrete examples of what, uh, of how I might sort of look at that in the context of the, the continental 48 United States. All right, so uh, I, I see that there are some other questions and we, you'll just have to wait for the next set. All right, go ahead, Arun. Um, yeah, thank you. So, <clears throat> I mean, let me say, um, let me say first that, that, that you know, one of the consequences of the line of thinking that I've been um, developing is, is that, um, you know, the question of um, cultural traditions of resistance, right? Like, you know, the way, the way you're, the way you're, uh, you know, we can think of it an in, something like an indigenous worldview and talk about holistic and so forth. But to me, I would think of it in terms of a tradition of resistance, right? Um, that, um, uh, that, that is informed by um, certain values and that have emerged as much from that resistance as um, from some idea of kind of the age old um, fixed culture of indigenous peoples, right? Like the indigenous peoples are in modernity, right? They're, they're kind of, um, they're in history. So um, uh, from that, you know, what, what this kind of analysis enables us to do is, is to, um, you know, is to, is to as, as Amilcar, uh, Amilcar Cabral says, you know, it's, it's culture is the seed of opposition, right? Um, it enables us to understand that. And, and that would be true of, of all anti-colonial struggles, including, you know, struggles of indigenous people today in the United States. Um, so, um, you know, that, that kind of follows from this, from this argument that we get from, from all the people I've been talking about, that, that capitalism is, um, is not something that, that um, generates you know entirely new terms of reference for for struggles right the past is still present um in those traditions of resistance um and um so and then you know coming on to the question of, of what this picture of surplus populations might look like in the um continental united states today um i mean i would say two things so you know one is that um you know as i was kind of pointing to in, in in what i had to say um it seems to me that that the border regime is is central to um this question um border you know border regimes don't um don't do the same thing that they would have done um to the extent they existed 100 years ago um uh, the 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 role of border regimes is to create is not to remove people um, it's to create a population of people who, of, with limited rights people who are going to be working right with limited rights so it, it, what it does is you know people people um, sometimes make the mistake of thinking of um, uh, borders as um, a way of protecting workers' rights, because you can say, well, um, you know, we need to defend the rights of workers in this country from competition with lower wage workers, that kind of old argument, right? But the, what borders do is weaken the working class because they create a section of it within the United States um, whose rights are, are, are reduced um, uh, uh, dramatically, right? Um, and so that's, you know, that's exactly um, explainable in terms of its argument I'm making. It starts to, it starts to look like a regime of coerced labor um, uh, within the capitalist mode of production that ostensibly operates on the basis of inverted commas, free labor, right? Um, free of, of political coercion. You know, there might be the economic coercion of, well, you just have to work, otherwise how are you gonna live? But free of political coercion, a border is political coercion, right? Um, uh, 
you know, then add to that the fact that, um, you know, the, I mean, the majority of people in the United States, the majority of adults in the United States don't have, um, you know, don't live at subsistence levels of reproduction. Um, they, you know, the, um, the majority of adult Americans do not make $20,000 a year, right? So, um, you know, there are huge numbers of people, um, apart from the question of borders, there are huge numbers of people in the United States who, um, you know, arguably the majority of people in the United States who are um, in this category of, of um, you know, what I call the, uh, what, what um, uh, Kelly and Sanyo calls the wasteland populations, right? Who, who would like the opportunity to be exploited in the way that Marx describes, right? But don't even have that. Um, and, and, you know, mass incarceration, as, as um, you know, a number of people point out, as, as Ruth Wilson Gilmore does uh, point out most, most powerfully, I think, um, is, you know, is linked to that need to manage those populations. And of course, they're racialized, right? Um, uh, in the ways that I, tr I try to describe. Now, coming to the question of wars. Um, so wars aren't, you know, war, again, like borders, wars are not what they were 100 years ago. Wars today, you know, call them small wars, call them, uh, I mean, perhaps war isn't even the right word to just, you know, to describe the, the flows of violence that um, something like the war on terror, the war on drugs, all the other kind of wars of counterinsurgency that um, empire in, um, generates. Um, uh, these are, you know, these are wars in which the boundary between policing and war is, has been um, eroded. Um, and, and so for me, you know, what you have to think of here is, um, is that they are playing an analogous role to the role of, um, you know, militarized policing and incarceration domestically. They're playing that same role globally, right? And again, um, it's about the, um, you know, the, the, the uh, in the ways that I tried to describe, the, the anxiety that these surplus populations generate, whether that's in Colombia or Palestine um, or, um, you know, rural India or wherever, right? Um, so, um, uh, you know, I think we can start to see how, how we can understand that kind of global, you know, hugely inflated global capacity for violence, um, to state violence, um, in terms of something very particular to the political economy of neoliberalism. Um, and, you know, and the other, I want to say this as well, which is, um, you know, whether you think of the war on terror or whether you think of the war on drugs, um, uh, under those under those names, um, you know, in each case, probably you know over a million people have been directly killed, um, not just um, killed indirectly through the the kind of um, destruction of health and food infrastructure and so on, but directly killed by by uh, militarized violence, right? Either directly by the United States military or by, by US's proxies elsewhere, right? So we're talking about, you know, if you think about the history of, you know, the kind of mass state violence in the 20th century, right? Um, the, 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 the sort of examples that might spring to mind would be, you know, the genocides, the Shoah, the Armenian, uh, Rwanda, perhaps Bosnia and so forth, right? Um, we haven't even begun to think about something like the war on terror or the war on drugs under that category, right? Which is what we should be doing. Um, uh, the, you know, the genocidal murder of over a million people in each case. Um, after the, you know, for good reason, after the, um, the Shoah, you know, West, at least European, if not Western intellectual thought was transformed by the fact of the Shoah. Right, like you could not continue to do um, philosophy, sociology, uh, etc., um, in the same way after you had been confronted with the reality that a supposedly modern European government killed millions of fellow Europeans. Right, we can get into you know like why that felt exceptional, given that that was happening in the colonies anyway, but. Um, you know, Hannah Arendt calls it the problem of evil. You can't get, uh, get around the problem of evil in the second half of the 20th century, right? It trans transforms intellectual life. We have to do that with, with how we think about these wars as well. We haven't even begun to think about what does it mean that in the last 20 years, um, uh, the US government has murdered millions of people, right? And we've just totally forgotten, we erased it. We don't, even think that it's a question to, to say, what does that say about 
our society? What can we learn from that? What can we do to stop that happening again? We're not having that conversation. All right. Uh, I've got several questions now, and I'll take three of them, starting with Molly. Go ahead, Molly. Hi, I had a question on what you think um, moving forward we should do with, it seems like capitalism and ne neoliberalism are really propellers of racism in modern day society. And you mentioned briefly move, movements against neoliberalism, like what historically has been done against that and what can we do now? Thank you, Molly. I have a question via chat from Dokar, uh, which reads as follows. Could Arun please elaborate on Mason's Wood and Harvey's analysis of racism and capitalism? You mentioned them briefly and in passing. And then um, we have a question from Sam Ashman. Go ahead, Sam. Oh, hi. Um, I'm in a part of the world where it's quite late, so I'm in my pajamas, so I'm not gonna, <laughs> I'm not gonna put the video on. Um, <laughs> thanks for uh, thanks for a great talk. I've got a question around the surplus population, and I suppose it's have you got any? If you could maybe say a little bit more about the extent to which this is a consequence of the way that there are different forms of capitalist development, because we we don't have this one universalizing model. Um, but but that would then see the surplus population as a creation of capitalism and, and as a part of capitalism. And I think sometimes in the literature it's it's, it's more of something which is outside of capitalism. So I suppose that's an in-out in -out, um, question. Mm -hmm. And then also on the surplus population, I think um, I, I, I work on South Africa and obviously, you know, 40% unemployment, that, that, you know, the serious surplus population. Um, it's, I think, isn't it, it's not simply the question of repression. Um, you know, there are, we, there's a, quite a sophisticated social grant system, which is really mm -hmm. the difference between life and death. For, for millions of people in South Africa. So, so it seems to me managing the surplus population isn't simply just ab about yeah. repression, even though I think that's really important, as, as you said. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, that's great, okay. Um, okay, let me, let me uh, start with um, thinking about, just quick, I won't go too long on this, but just quickly on David Harvey and Adam Meeskin Woods. So, um, so, so, so what I'm disagreeing with in the way that they approach these questions is this. Um, uh, simplifying a lot for, for the sake of time, obviously, um, the, the kind of core of their way of thinking about this is to say, let's, let's try and abstract out from all the specific um, contexts where capitalism exists um, and, and tell a story about um, the kind of, um, inner workings of the capitalist machine of accumulation, right? And what's necessary for that to get going, right? Um, and, um, and, and, you know, we can do that without needing to talk about race, because it seems to be able to function just on its own terms without invoking race, right? Um, in, in actual specific contexts, some of them at least, it seems, they say, race does... Um, start to interact with capitalism. So, conclusion, um, the universal process of capital accumulation does not inherently involve racism, but contingently in particular places, racism um, might come in as a particular factor. Why in those places and not others? Because in those places there's a, um, a pre-existing history prior to capitalism um, that um, that enable that where so that racism survives anachronistically into the capitalist era, okay. And in fact, that's the only place they can go once they've started um, uh, with their premises on how to understand capitalism. That's the only place they can go to explain racism is the pre-capitalist past. Otherwise, um, it, you would have to explain racism as internal to capitalism, right? Um, so for me, that's that's wrong. In fact, that's um, uh, misguided methodologically as well as empirically and so forth, right? So why is that wrong? Because um, we, you know, to be honest, I don't think it's, it's what Marx intended um, as his method to kind of gather together all this apparent, apparent data on what capitalism looks like and then try and generalize from it to some abstraction called capitalism. You don't see Marx doing that in his writing for good reason, because um, you would simply, 
end up with abstractions that don't really get, have any explanatory power. You're just putting a label on something that you abstract out from, from a complex social process, right? So let's instead deal with specific capitalisms um, and try and analyze those. And when you do that, um, I think for the reasons that I've, I've given, you have to imagine capitalism as coexisting in a structure and a complex structure with non-capitalism. The two go together uh, in, a, in a complex whole, right? So you never get pure capitalism, right? Um, and, um, and, and, and for that reason, um, in that complex whole of kind of capitalism with its inside and something outside, always needs something like race. It might not be race, it might be caste, it might be some idea of ethnicity, it might be some other kind of social differentiation, but it needs something like that, right? Um, for the reasons that I, that I hopefully have, have brought out. Um, and that's also the answer to, um, to Sam's question about you know, thinking about the inside and the outside of capitalism. Like part of where you end up with this line of thinking is that um, you know, what we think of as the inside of capitalism is, is, you know, is always structurally related to an outside, right, as it were. Right? So the, um, uh, the um, you know, surplus, surplus populations um, are generated by um, that relationship between the capitalist and the non-capitalist mode of production within a social formation. Okay. Um, the, and, and I agree completely that, that, you know, the other part of this story is the, um, you know, is, is the kind of um, welfare systems that exist um, at both at national levels and at global levels, you know, the whole kind of development complex around, around um, that's, that, you know, that, um, that serves to, to produce a kind of subsistence for these surplus populations as part of, their, as part of this process of management, right? Um, what do we do? Molly's question, what do we do? Okay, so obviously I can't answer that question um, in a few minutes, nor would I have the um, I mean, that, you know, you have to be pretty crazy to think you could answer that question anyway, to be honest. So, um, but let me say this. So, so firstly, um, uh, you know, what I, what I think is we need to, so there's a couple of things that we can say here. One is we need to get away from the assumption that, um, that the key to successful movement building is to find um, some pre-existing commonality among the participants in that movement. Right. So this is, you know, it, it's that assumption that that often drives people to want to have this idea of the universal proletariat. Right. Like this class is already a class in itself. Therefore, it's very easy for us to make it a class for itself. Right. Like the, the there's already a guarantee that that is going to work as a movement building strategy. And we can do the same things with regard to, you know, with, with regard to other social categories like race. We, you know, there's a temptation to say, um, you know, um, black people are automatically already mobilized as a coherent political force, right? Just by virtue of their blackness. And therefore, um, you know, um, uh, that commonality is, is kind of given already in our social being, right? Um, uh, which is seductive because it means then, you know, kind of like just the last step in organizing is to acknowledge that, right? Um, uh, which, would, which would seem to be relatively easy. Uh, but, you know, and the whole debate about allies then becomes impossible to resolve within that framework because an ally is necessarily never going to have that commonality, right? Well, there aren't, the, there aren't these given um, kind of commonalities in, in social structures that enable, you know, that automatically generate collectivities, right? Collectivities are made, not discovered, right? And they're made through recognizing our independent interdependence. Um, they're made through recognizing the the differentiations that I've been talking about, right? Um, so that's the that's the first thing. Um, and the second thing is, you know, we have, um, you know, the, one of the things about neoliberalism that we have to remember very and focus on very clearly all the time in thinking about movements is neoliberalism destroys the soul, right? It individualizes us. Um, it, you know, um, it's it the you know, including the, the way that social media works as an attention economy, right? It sets us up to compete with each other for resources, for commodities, for attention, which is a commodity, right? Um, 
these, you know, neo neoliberalism is something that needs to be erased from our souls before we can begin the work of organizing even, right? As, or as part of the process of organizing. Um, we, need to, we need to find a way to rediscover that sense of our mutual interdependence, right? That none of us is an individual um, in the sense that we're privatized from each other. We each grow through our, our relationships with others. We exist through our relationships with others. And that is the, the kind of human level on which we can begin to build um, collectivities, right? But we have to just acknowledge how difficult that is and in a neoliberal culture. It's much harder than it would have been um, in, an, you know, in a kind of industrial culture, um, which doesn't mean that we can't do it, but that's the challenge we have. All right, great. All right, I've got a couple of more questions. And uh, one of them via chat, and obviously, if you're doing it via chat, you're probably not inclined to do what I'm about to ask, which is that if you are going to ask a question um, not through chat, I want you to activate your camera because it makes it better for the recording. All right, so I've got a question from Michael Dover, um, who asks or states, thank you for mentioning the two-stage strategy of the South African Communist Party, which Charno's neoliberal apartheid, published in 2017, said distinguished between uh, apartheid and capitalism. Later, Slovo presented a three-system three analysis and a three-stage strategy. First, there would be a national democratic revolution designed to end apartheid, set up electoral democracy, and institute constitutionally prescribed human rights. Next, there would be a global struggle for democratic socialism that could eventually end economic exploitation. Only in a third stage would communism bring with it the elimination of all forms of alienation. This three system, three stage seemed to me then and seems now to be of tactical and strategic importance. Charno, however, named racial capitalism as an analytical perspective which might have better informed the movement then and now. I'm not convinced. Are you and why? <laughs> all right. So Jordan Camp also has asks a, has a question, and if anybody else does, please raise your hand now. Go ahead, and Jordan, and please activate your camera. Hey, uh, thanks so much, uh, Arun, for this brilliant talk. As you know, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of your work, and likewise. You know, th th <laughs> thank you. This is such rich research. As far as I know, um, you're the first to draw out these connections between what's happening with exiles from South Africa and London with Cedric Robinson in England and to give us a fully fleshed out intellectual history, political economy and social theory of racial capitalism in the way that you did this afternoon. So it's a significant theoretical labor and my hat's truly off to you. And I, I thank, thank you. you for that, it helps me. Um, so I wanted to ask you or to say a little bit more about the importance of thinking through the current conjuncture in the way that you laid out of racism and neoliberalism and it kind of, you know, you, I think, rightly point us to the material manifestations of racism, borders, security, counterterrorism, and the rest of it. Um, but you also warn us against transhistorical or ahistorical understandings and suggest to us the political consequences of that. And so that's what I'm interested in hearing a little bit more about. I mean, why, to paraphrase Hall, do we need to attend how racism has been constructed and made operative in different conditions at the same, you know, and this seems to me about a link to this problem of um, the combination of different modes of production, right? And the way that you're drawing out from Harold Wolpe's rich um, categories and theories, but also, you know, there's this problem of how racism itself dehistoricizes by translating historically specific conditions into timeless and a historical categories mm -hmm. itself. And it seems to me that that produces a kind of problem for anti-racist uh, thought in, in this conjuncture in particular, but that your theoretical framework gives us a way to solve that problem. So I'd just love to hear more and, and thanks again for the work. Thanks, Jordan. Uh, we have a question uh, from Daniel Hawkins in the, in the chat, uh, who asked a question about what works. Would you, Arun, suggest what would, what would you suggest to explore how we eradicate neoliberalism from our souls? <laughs> <laughs> so there you okay. go. Those are your three questions in this set. 
Thank you. Uh, okay, so um, quickly. So uh, yeah, I mean, on, on South Africa, um, uh, I, I guess um, I don't want to, you know, claim to be an expert on, on the, the kind of details of the, of the anti-apartheid struggle and the continuing struggles. Um, uh, my, my, um, my kind of modest, um, uh, relatively uninformed answer to your question would be, um, you know, we're in danger whenever we separate out the struggle against racism from the struggle against capitalism, right? And, and, and try and see one and the other in different stages. Um, uh, because um, uh, of, of, of the arguments I've been making about how, how those two are implicated, if we, if we just try and fight um, one without the other, we will um, get caught um, uh, on our left flank or you know, on our right flank, whichever side you want to put it, um, uh, by, the, by the incompleteness of our, of our analysis and of our, of our political work. So, um, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that kind of follows as a, as a, as a kind of conclusion from the, the sort of broad analysis I've been developing. Um, uh, on um, how we eradicate neoliberalism from our souls, I mean, we need to um, do that through organizing, right? Like the, the way to do that is to, is to put ourselves into um, forms of political organization um, that, um, that forces out of our privatization, our individual privatization that neoliberalism engenders, right? Um, you know, we, we need to, um, it, it's through that, that, through being in organized radical politics that, that, our, um, that, that, that we transform ourselves, right? Um, so, so the, I mean, that, that's the only answer that I can, I can see. Um, uh, Jordan's question. Um, so, you know, what, so what, um, for, for me, um, and you know, this, this, I derive this, this argument from amongst others, Stuart Hall. Um, for me, um, you know, the, the temptation that we, we can always very easily get um, seduced into is the view that um, race is this trans historical thing, and because that's how it presents itself. Right, um, and um, and as soon as we've done that, we've already lost. Right, because what we're doing is we're participating in the dehistoricization and the naturalization of um, of race. Um, for the, the, you know that it, that is definitive of it, um, and and you know that can happen in ways that sound radical. Right, like um, it, you know. The, the new, you know, the, the New York Times um, 1619 project, this excellent, you know, piece of historical work, um, you know, kind of popularizing, I think some of the, some of the work um, um, that's been really good around, around thinking about histories of capitalism and plantation slavery um, slips into this, right, sometimes. So, um, you know, there's a, you know, for example, a phrase, I think, um, from that project where it says something like, um, uh, white supremacy was encoded into the DNA of American capitalism, right, from its birth, right? Um, now, you know, don't want to over, you know, kind of overstate what is, what is actually just a metaphor about the permanence of racism in the United States. But, um, you know, whenever, for me, whenever I hear that word inherent, right, that, so, that, that something is inherent in America or inherent in modernity or inherent in capitalism, I'm, I want to know, like, how you know how is that inherent secured how is that inherent secured from one time to the next right it's all you know inherent is one warning word for me another one is legacy right like public discourse in the united states continuously talks about the legacy of racism right the legacy of of um of, of racial violence the legacy of slavery right um as if these things kind of impinge on us um you know, from the past, and we're just, we're just kind of gradually, slowly, you know, we're always in the, okay, I'm, being, I'm kind of going around in circles. Let me put it this way. The, the prevailing kind of liberal political discourse on race in the United States tells a story that is progressive, right? That it's historically progressive. It says, 
and we are progressing. There is this bad past. That legacy of the past has been handed down to us in our generation. And if we just do this one last push, we'll be there in the post-racial future, right? I mean, that's Obama's speeches on race. That's Joe Biden's speeches on race. That's every um, kind of NPR program on race, right? <laughs> um, now, in the face of that, terrible account of, of like where we're at that's really not where we're at at all where we're at is racism regenerating itself in all kinds of new ways right so in the face of that liberal progressive story the temptation is to say you liberals don't get it this thing is so deep and permanent in this country right but unfortunately that gets us into a problem as well which is um, we then we then support the very dehistoricizing naturalizing feature of race, right? And this is the problem with Afro-pessimist for, for me, is that it, you know, it mirrors white supremacy in a certain sense, right? It erases resistance to, to white supremacy, right? It's that resistance that forces the constant transformation. Unless we understand that resistance, unless we can build on those histories of resistance, um, we don't stand a chance, right? That to, to, to stand a chance, we need to see the vulnerability of these structures, um, their fragility, um, uh, and, and be able to act on that basis. Um, but, um, you know, to, to, kind of, um, to, to kind of remove these structures from history and say, this, you know, this stuff somehow magically is just this permanent feature of modernity, it doesn't, um, doesn't help us. All right. All right, I have a couple of more questions and I think that that would actually be perfect to, to wrap things up given the amount of time we have left. One via chat from Claire who says, what impact do you think job automation will have on the current structure of racial capitalism? And then I have a question from Phil Gasper who's activated his video. There you go, Phil. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Great, thanks Aaron, great, uh, great talk. Um, and uh, what interests me is that this isn't just an academic discussion right now. This is a debate which has um, uh, been taking place in the, in the US left uh, over the past few years, um, how to understand the relationship between race and class. I mean, that's always been an issue, but it's actually <laughs> um, been debated with some of the people who've been writing about this in academic um, arenas. Uh, over the past few years. And there's one, so you've got people like Adolf Reed who have taken what I would say, they don't describe it this way, but what I would say is a class reductionist view, which is the argument that um, uh, you can deal with uh, racial inequity by, by raising universal class demands and, and, uh, um, and also making the argument that anti-racism, uh, this is Reed's view, um, is, uh, uh, it is a um, uh, as a you know as a as a uh, as a political <laughs> uh, organizing strategy falls into the trap of neoliberalism. Um, I mean, Reed's Reed's view is that if you're an anti-racist, then you get sucked into what you were just talking about the the Obama uh, Democratic Party establishment view of of uh, how you get rid of racism, um, which ignores the class inequalities that, that, um, that it's bound up with. Um, and on the other side, you've got people who are arguing um, that you have to take on race issues and class issues um, in, an, in, a, in, in an integrated way. And this is the question though I want to ask because clearly, I mean, we've had this year in the US this huge, uh, massive anti-racist movement um, uh, over the past six months, um, focused particularly on the issue of police violence and police killings. Um, and so that's, you know, it's for, for most of us, that's a huge step forward in terms of building a, um, a, a, a vibrant fighting left in the, in the US. But this movement hasn't taken on class issues, not in any direct way. It hasn't, it doesn't pose itself as, as challenging neo, neoliberalism. Um, so I, I wonder if you have any thoughts about that. How, how can a movement which is focused around police violence um, become a movement which takes on the much bigger issue of, of uh, neoliberal capitalism as well? 
All right, Thank so you. we'll leave it at that. But those are the final two questions. Go ahead, Adam. Okay, so, um, yeah, I mean, I, um, so on the question of automation, um, uh, I mean, you, you know, it's interesting to, to read um, James Boggs, you know, um, uh, black Marxist writing in the 1960s on automation, right? Um, uh, and and I, I think his analysis is is um, anticipates this, you know where we're at today, um, which you know he sees he's he's you know he's working on the assembly lines in um, in in the auto plants in Detroit, right? And um, he's seeing how um, automation is is going to um, render you know a surplus population in this in this city, right? And and he thinks through what that means, how it how it affects questions of race, how it, um uh you know challenges um some of our assumptions about how we think capitalism works right and and so you know part of the um part of the body of thinking that feeds into these these arguments about racial capitalism is precisely starts from the question of automation in fact um so i, I think you know um i think sometimes the um the extent to which automation is going to be transformative over the coming years might be overstated but um, the, the direction of travel is going to be that, you know, that the, the surplus population is going to grow and grow. And that um, intensifies exactly this contradiction, right, um, between um, how, how, you know, between the model of capitalism as this kind of exploiting force and the model of capitalism as this force that denies people even the opportunity to be exploited, right? Um, and and um, so, yeah, I think it's pertinent. Um, on, on Phil's question, uh, um, so you know, I think, I mean, one of the things that's interesting to me is, is, um, so, you know, there is a there is a danger sometimes in the way that the left talks about race and class right now that that we are um, allowing ourselves to get into um, into what are kind of terminal almost terminological debates about something. Um, uh, with with kind of cliched positions called class reductionism or, or um, anti-racism, whatever, that don't co actually correspond, you know, they often don't correspond to anything that anyone actually holds, right? Um, I'm not, you know, Adolf Reed, um, uh, you know, not that long ago that you would have found him in a debate with Ellen Meeskins Wood making precisely the arguments against her um, that the other people now make against him, right? We're in danger of getting lost in, in a kind of hall of mirrors here, right? On this stuff sometimes, right? Um, now, I mean, that's why I appreciate, you know, the way that you've ended the question on, you know, like how do we, what does this mean for movements, right? Like we have people on the streets um, engaged in a struggle against police violence. I think it's probably more than the struggle against police violence. Um, I mean, you know, that movement uses the, the term racial capitalism to understand, I mean, to, de to, to describe what it's up against, right? Um, and the, the kind of, um, the, the material that that movement generates and the conversations it's generating do not just limit themselves to the question of police violence, but understand that police violence in terms of um, uh, the broader stru structures of racial capitalism. Now, your, you know, your question is the right one. How does it move? From this focus on police violence to um, to something broader, right? Um, and I and I think um, how that's not going to happen is is by um, it abandoning its focus on anti-racism and switching to a language of what you call class demands. Because I think anti-racism is a class demand, right? And that follows from my analysis, right? It's just that we have to understand class differently from how it's how it's often understood in um, you know, in, in a lot of Marxist and a lot of left uh, discourse. Um, so, so one of the, I think one of the advantages of, of the kind of thinking that I'm describing is that it, it does enable you to see a path of, um, of understanding that, you know, the struggle against police ra um, racism, police violence, um, in the end, does implicate the whole of racial capitalism. And therefore it can be connected to the struggle of, um, say, you know, workers in an Amazon plant, or um, people um, uh, organizing in workplaces more generally, or people organizing around um, fossil fuels and so on, right? Like the connections do become 
um, viable. And, and moreover, those connections um, need not be understood as, you know, here is the initial um, uh, inciting incidents that, that generate some political movement, but then we gradually pull away from those initial issues to see the real um, forces of, of um, capital accumulation behind it all. We allow ourselves to, to live in the specificity of particular issues and struggles and struggles of particular racialized groups while also connecting those to the broader struggle against um, capitalism as a whole, right? Like that's what we need to get to. That's what I'm trying to point towards with that um, image from Sivananda at the end of my presentation, the, the way that we can um, uh, uh, fight a universal struggle with particularity, right? I think that's the way.